Hello and welcome to the Unstoppable Brands Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Schwartz, and today I'm joined by our guest, Anne Ryan. Vice Hi, President. Alex. Hi, Anne. <laughs> she is the Vice President, Director of Brand Strategy at Brownstein. Thanks for being here, Anne. Thanks, Alex. You make me sound very important. I appreciate that. You are very important. Some, uh, some days. Some days. I, I think every day, but that's just my opinion. Um, okay. Since graduating from Kutztown University, Anne has worked with brands including Citibank, Ikea, and Wawa. With a range of experiences in digital marketing, user experience, and brand strategy, Anne has been a part of Brownstein for more than eight years, where she oversees the brand strategy of major regional and national brands. Using large data sets and the brand longevity ecosystem, she assesses the, me the messaging and creative elements of major corporations that allows branding to resonate with consumers. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to talk about your career journey and uh, yep. brand strategies during economically challenging times and what you see for the future of marketing. But first, mm -hmm. Anne, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Alex. I had a pretty easy morning with the kid. I've got just a few meetings today, no back to back. So it's already a good day. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, so our first question today is you started your career journey working on interactive voice response systems for financial institutions. Yeah. What experiences early on in your career informed your work today? I was a political science major in college, and I was set to go to the Peace Corps because I thought I could go save the world, uh, come back from the Peace Corps, potentially work for an NGO, do some sort of humanitarian work. Uh, my dad, who was my high school guidance counselor, was adamant that I get a real job uh, after college while I wait the nine months before I was set to leave for the Peace Corps. And so that's how I got the job um, at the IVR agency. And what I learned through all of that is that I liked business. It was a master class in business and marketing that I thought I wasn't interested in, that I was somewhat very against morally as a person, but over, over a few months time, I really liked being a part of a marketing organization. And I loved learning about um, conversion rates and abandon rates and looking at call reports to see, you know, of these 18,000 callers, where in the credit card application process are most people hanging up? Where can we rewrite that prompt to retain them? Um, what is, you know, the language to promote the city advantage card? So you know, I, I got to pick and choose little learnings and pieces of, of business that taught me so much about marketing in general and where I am today. So if you think about that, I'm a 22, 23 year old kid, really just exposed to so much business and marketing knowledge and experience that I didn't even know I wanted. And so that that knowledge and that just like the foundational experience is alive every single day as I work now in all different channels and for all different clients. You mentioned that you were promoted quickly um, when you were working in interactive voice response. I know you were also were not at Brown Scene very long before you were promoted into this role. Is there anything that you can single out as a tribute and like attribute your success to? Yeah, there are two different answers, but in case it's helpful for anybody for starting out in at uh, the IVR agency, uh, I remember I was maybe six to eight months into the job and I had been promoted from QA specialist to account manager. And my boss at the time said, you know, you don't quite have the years or the experience that we typically would require for you to move into this role. But she said, I believe in you. I see how much knowledge you have. I see your eagerness. I see your commitment. So I'm going to work really closely with you. Um, there was a moment where, you know, I, I, I'm a country girl and I had just moved to Philly for this job and I was going out a lot. And sometimes I would go out on a Thursday night and I would roll into work Friday in the same clothes that I wore Thursday. And my boss caught on and it was one of the most poignant conversations I've had to date where you know, she brought me into her office after a few weeks of this. And she said, look, I understand your stage in life. I understand this is a whole new world, Philly, you know, being out on your own. I had my own apartment. And she said, but you need to decide what you want. Mm 
you need to decide if you're really committed to building your career here and proving yourself in this role, or if you know, you're not quite ready for this level of responsibility. And she was good with any answer, but she was very direct and fair, uh, but, but she, she saw me and she gave me the opportunity to have the conversation with her. And it was a wake up call. It was the wake up call that I needed. So from that point on, I, I doubled down and it wasn't out of, out of fear. Um, it wasn't out of fear of losing a job. It was because she believed in me so much and gave me that amount of respect that I wanted to give myself that same level of respect and really prove what I was capable of. Um, so it really was just commitment. And what is similar then to now is from that point on, I said yes to everything. Any any ad hoc project within the IVR agency, I raised my hand for, I wanted to be a part of. Um, I took the time to sit with the developers and their part of the building and learn the ins and out of their jobs. The same with the fulfillment guys, the same with the voice talent. So you know, I really learned in depth every single function so I could understand more about how to flex um, my own knowledge as I was partnering with the client at Citibank to understand, you know, what are all the possibilities for every program that we were executing. And if any challenge came up, I could speak more intelligently to how fulfillment works or dev works because I took the time. So saying yes and really taking the time to understand is the red thread there because at Brownstein, it was a little bit similar in that I joined here, uh, and I think this is an important lesson. I was at a B2B agency before Brownstein, and that agency focused on digital. And while I went to that agency because the iPhone became a thing in 2007 when it launched, the Facebook became Facebook, and you know Google was just this massive channel. And so while IVR was a really benefit beneficial foundational platform for my learning, I realized the ways of the world were going towards digital and I wanted to learn that. So I went to the digital agency in an account management role and very quickly, again, my boss there was like, you have the right mind to learn SEO, to understand what keywords people would be searching on to find the products and services our clients are offering. And so that's how I really learned um, search both, you know, SEM and SEO. I launched a content marketing offering there. I understood, you know, the website experience really impacted search rankings. That's how I ended up doing a bit of UX design. And then ultimately realized that when we get someone to a website, it's really about the message and the brand and how we're differentiating to capture that lead or to capture that conversion. And that's how I got into the world of branding. And so I realized it's a roundabout answer, but the point is to, to be so curious about how all of the different parts and components of marketing work and impact each other and to say yes to learning all of them and to say yes to sitting next to the experts who already know how to do them. And that's why I then went to Brownstein Group, because I love the branding piece so much that I wanted to be taught. And so while I was the director of brand and analytics at the B2B agency, the only position Brownstein had available was a brand strategist. It was a demotion both in title and pay. But I knew that going to an ad agency that focused on branding was greater purpose and fulfillment for me at that point. And again, just to learn, to learn from who I consider to be the best in the city. And so I took the demotion and I took the pay cut and I went to Brownstein and I did the same thing. I said yes to every project given to me. I asked to be involved in clients or projects that weren't assigned, but were interesting. I made sure that I got to know all of the account people. I made sure I got to build rapport with the PR team, with the creative team. And so again, it's just, it's just being so proactive in building relationships and taking on every project that your day can possibly hold. It's that kind of eagerness and hustle that shows people that you're, you're committed, you're capable, and that you'll figure it out. Because if I've realized anything, it's that there isn't just one way to do any kind of marketing. There are several ways. Most of us try to reinvent it to some extent, 
each time just to prove that it can be better each time. And I think if you can build trust that you're a, a figure outer, you can figure it out, um, people are going to give you a chance. And that's why Aaron and, and Mark at that time gave me a chance to manage the team and then eventually be the somewhat fearless leader. <laughs> I, I love that so much, Anne. So I want to switch gears and mm -hmm. talk about some of the economic situations and how they affect brands. Yep. So we've all heard about the looming economic uncertainty at this point. Um, lots of different analysts are putting lots of different models out. But one thing that everybody seems to agree on is that the economy is not headed to a better place right now. So with yep. that in mind, um, as consumers are kind of tightening their budgets um, and being more careful about the ways that they spend their money, what can brands do to, to really resonate with their consumers? Yeah, it's it's what I would argue brands should always do, which is offer real value and utility to their audiences. Um, you know, if there's anything that we've seen over the last five to seven years, certainly pre pre pandemic and during the pandemic, it was a lot of anthemic brand building, either anthemic pre pandemic in terms of, you know, either very entertaining and eccentric spots or, you know, very emotional spots where, you, you know, you have goosebumps or you're like, why am I crying? Um, and it often was for an entertainment factor, you know, regardless which emotion and lens that entertainment was trying to conjure. Um, and then through the pandemic, it, it was a bit of the same, though the lens was offering comfort and reassurance and a, a bit, also some brands use their platform to show all the ways they were helping and really making a difference as, as they should. Mm -hmm. Now, it is somewhat similar to that in that brands need to demonstrate to their audiences now how they are doing everything they can to bring the best value to their customers. You know, every, every brand really needs to take that into account that, you know, as marketers and advertisers, like it's the most fun to work on really anthemic projects and moving forward though, brands need to find the right balance of making sure that their brand promise, their essence, you know, those emotional benefits that they want to communicate, they can still be present and they should still be present in the spot. But the focus should really be on the idea of value and helping your consumer this year get the best deal or afford the things in their lives that they need. Even if you're not directly selling a consumer good, I, there can there has to be some amount of sensitivity to the fact that everyone is just a little bit more strapped. We're all in a little bit of a holding pattern when it comes to spending. Um, and that brands just need to like know what time it is and not necessarily put out these big sweeping aspirational anthemic videos, campaigns, or spots, and, you know, instead just take a more realistic tone to the cultural moment in the world that we're living in. So it's a balance. It's a balance of emotional brand building that should still be rooted in a brand promise. And every brand out there's brand promise should be anchored by how you're helping the consumer. What are you promising them your brand is going to do to improve their everyday life in some way? And so focus on that, focus on the consumer benefit. And if possible, focus on how you deliver value. And if value isn't in savings programs and member rewards and discounts, value can be in saving time. It can be in convenience messages. Any, any way that your brand can actually help take a little bit of pressure off your, your consumer, that really should be core to the campaign. It's why we are so committed to the brand longevity model, because we constantly have to be analyzing all the various levers and components to ensure that our brands are communicating in a way that is so highly relevant and meaningful to the end consumer. Sometimes brands can communicate in ways that are more self-serving. And there's a time and place for that. 
But when you're in a stressful cultural moment, which we have been for a few years and we are in again now, brands need to put the, some of the self-promotion aside and realize that they're going to earn the most affinity, potential loyalty, website traffic or sales. You know, there's business metrics here as well uh, by making it so crystal clear how they can help their consumer. The last question I want to ask you today yep. is um, kind of a catch-all, but what do you anticipate as the biggest change coming to brand strategy in the next few years? Yeah. So I've thought about this question since you sent it over and my answer is really predicated on the kinds of assignments that brand strategy is getting. And it occurred to me that we write plenty of creator briefs throughout the year where we're, we're mining for that really rich insight that is the launch pad for the creative team to concept the next great creative campaign. That's true. And that will always be true of uh, brand strategy and, you know, particularly the account planning practice. What I'm seeing more of from clients, though, is they're asking for our help to come into their organizations and workshop with them, workshop all the different dimensions of their brand, you know, whether it's their brand purpose, their brand promise, you know, their values, their value proposition, their USP. Every brand has different inputs that they use to help simplify them, to help make them clearer, to help get closer to their core audiences and how their brand can really be articulated in a way where, where it'll be very easy for anyone within the organization, marketing, or any agency partner to take the brand strategy and execute in a way that's more impactful to the end consumer. So we've been doing more workshops and partnering with our clients more to crystallize their brand strategies and bring them into 2023. So that's that's definitely a little bit of a shift for us to go from being, you know, the consumer insight creative brief team to being relied on as a consultant and really as as a business partner because the brand strategies don't just sit in advertising. They guide all aspects of an organization. So that's a big change that I've been seeing for sure. And we are seeing clients realize now that we all have to police ourselves because our audiences can take in one powerful message. But the minute we start layering in three, four, five additional pieces of communication to communicate, you, you just you kind of say enough, like I'm, I'm good. And, and you can sometimes see consumers shut down a little bit in some categories. There are other categories like Medicare, for example, where you have an audience who wants to see every single feature and benefit of a Medicare Advantage or Medicare supplement product. So it's not true in every case across the board, certainly depending on what you're selling and depending on who you're selling it to. There's a general difference, uh, generational difference in the kind of information that consumers want and need when it comes to making a decision about a, a product or a service they're going to buy. But I would say it is a it is a trend to just take the approach of less is more. And you do see it a bit in advertising, a bit in visual design. You certainly see it in websites now. Ten years ago, our clients would have websites with hundreds and hundreds of pages. And over the last few years, it's it's been more of a focus to not have more than like 15 to 20 pages on a website. So I think everybody is realizing from a marketing point of view, it's our job to capture attention. It's our job to capture information, lead information, and then let the CRM program or let the call center or let the sales team take it from there and deliver the rest of the information that the consumer needs to know. Uh, Anne, thank you so much for being here. Um, of course. I'm so appreciative of the insights you shared. And um, I, I wanted to say that if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, go ahead and share uh, sh or share the video with your friends, anybody you think that might find this interesting. And uh, Hit that subscribe button to see more of the Unstoppable Brands podcast. Thanks, Anne. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it.